Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. This is going to be a very relaxed stream. Unfortunately, I don't have any music to go with it, because every time I try to put music to anything, I get copyright bugged. Let me go ahead and say hello to the chat so far as it is. We got Jesse Guaradado, or Guarado, uh, Fearless Wolf. And that seems to be it for now. We'll probably grow a little bit more as we go on here, as people realize that something's actually happening. But real quick, I know we didn't get a very good view of this on the unboxing yesterday, because, well, you know, or Friday. But uh, here's the bananas. The official masterpiece bananas for Optimus Primal. They are hilarious. And they come... This little banana crate. Hello, Aquamarine, Stephen S., White Nova, Arm Professional. All right. So, as I posted on to the community tab yesterday, we're just going to relax for a little bit. Don't know how long the stream is going to last. Could be 30 minutes, could be an hour, but I wound up getting some books in the mail. One of which I went over on the stream. It's uh, the little box that had all the BotCon stuff in it. It had a t-shirt, a pen, and a book. Well, the BotCon book is the is the history and product guide for BotCon that we're going to go over because I got a lot of memories there. But the other two books that seem to get more interest is I found a couple of art books. One's a character designs guide and the other is just an art of book. The art book is for SWAT cats. The character designs is for Darkwing Duck. But here's the interesting thing. Neither of these books are official. None of them were made by Cartoon Network or Disney or Warner Brothers. And for the best I could find, nobody knows where these things came from. But they've got some interesting things in them. So all the stuff in it is from official sources. But we don't know who compiled these books. I found them on eBay and you can still find them. They're they're not out of print. They're still there. Uh, the Darkwing Duck book's about 25 bucks. The SWAT Cat book's is about 65 bucks. They're not by it now, but nobody's really running to pick them up. So they got some interesting stuff to them. So we're going to go over them. But, you know. But, chat, you guys are here. So which one do you guys want to, uh, from Michael Swan again? What are you talking about? Anywho, which one do you guys want to go over first? Michael Swanigan makes these and sells them? Well, they're not bad quality overall. It's got some issues, but they're not bad quality. Why am I not surprised that you know who did this, Grim? Why am I not surprised? Anywho, do you guys want to go over the SWAT Cat one, the Darkwing Duck one, or the Bot Cat BotCon one first? Here, we'll make, this, we'll make this easier so you guys don't have to type it all out. Hello, Vinkman. One for BotCon, two for Darkwing Duck, three for SWAT Cats. That'll make it easier for me to track. Well, I guess people really want to go with Darkwing Duck. So, let me go ahead and Darkwing Duck here. We're going to have a hard time with all the glare here because I got the light up here for better lighting. But the book's not bound poorly. It's decent quality. Of course, it's soft cover. I prefer hard cover for books like this, but soft cover. Let's go ahead and take a look in the entrance here. It looks like, because it says series description here, and just how the page is laid out, it looks like this is a solicitation that they would send to networks about Darkwing Duck. And it goes on about, you know, stay tuned for the adventure and intrigue, drama mixed with deadly danger, 
and it starts talking about Darkwing and the occasional cast of characters here. So we got a very uh, somewhat overused image of Darkwing here that we found initially in promotional material that wound up going in other places. You got Launchpad here, which hatch lines. You can remind me later, computer. To indicate shading and shape. Very basic here. Goslin on the opposing page, but on the other page here. The pain, pain of using these types of cameras for this book, right? Got a detailed shot of the gas gun. Yeah. Got Honker, and then of course it talks about the Shush Agency. Again, this is all, like, even down here you'll see numbers on the page, right? But it's not all like that, as you can see. So it's obvious these were pulled from different sources. And if this Michael Swanigan guy is who Grimm says he is, which I have no doubt to think so, it'd be interesting to pick his brain and find out where he got quite a bit of this stuff and why he's compiling it like this. Not that I'm complaining, mind you. Steelbeak, Tusker Nini, my literally least favorite villain in the entire Doggone show. Let me go ahead and see if I can move this mic away that I don't bump it every time I move my arm. Megavolt and Bushroot. And these are, of course, character synopses. They're not too in-depth as you would expect them to be. It's not the series Bible. Now, this is where you have to flip the entire way you look the book around. Because now, we're looking at model sheets. Yeah, this book is filled with model sheets primarily. It's not a very big book, right? It's about half the size of the SWAT Cats one. That actually makes it a little easier for us to look at it too now, doesn't it? So we have the character model of Darkwing Duck, who's three and a half heads. And on this opposing page, see if I can get that in shot. You can see just various different poses of Darkwing. Actually, I could probably just... Can I... Will you let me? Yes. Yeah, so... I really like stuff like this for a couple reasons. Uh, number one, it's always fun to have on-hand stuff. But also, it means I don't have to use Google Images because sometimes it can uh, send me in directions I don't want to go. There are things I do not want to see. Yeah, most of this Darkwing Duck related stuff, like if you're a hardcore Darkwing Duck aficionado, you'll, you'll recognize from other things. Of course, this image has been put around and flipped everywhere. Use cape for strong line of action. This is a topic I'm going to be covering on the channel at some point. I've actually got a Patreon exclusive for a Negaduck custom action figure. So, if you guys are interested in that, feel free to hop onto the Patreon. There's that Darkwing Duck pose again that's used all over the place. Some of these things I actually haven't even seen out in the ether, so that's a plus too. A lot of this you can find online, but some of this you can't. But you can tell that he got these from somebody's portfolio because you can see... Right up here. All the hole punches. Oh, it worked on the real Ghostbusters, huh? So that's Michael. Maybe I, I ought to bring him on the channel sometime. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that, Grim. <laughs> Gross. Uh, Michael Swanigan, apparently he's got like a bunch of stuff. So it'd be interesting to talk to him. Drake Mallard. Showing how Darkwing Duck's... Cape opening closes, and how it's under the lapels. And the show was actually animated by multiple different animation studios, so how it was animated would vary from episode to episode. Really interesting stuff when you dig into uh, Darkwing Duck and how it operated. Unfortunately, that animation studio has long since closed down. Uh, no Toon Logic, none of these, except for the BotCon one I'm covering today, are official, oddly enough. I like that they show the the head breakdown, too. That's really cool. Jaw flows out from Oval. I've drawn this character so many times at this point, I kind of just know it by heart. But if you notice, there's a very unique style to these. Um, I don't know how well I'll be able to show it, but if you'll notice... The pupils on Darkwing specifically are actually outside, in some cases, of the eye line. No, Mark Hamill didn't do the voice of Darkwing Duck and Negaduck. Jim Cummings did. It just feels like Mark Hamill's done everybody's voice. Yeah, 
And of course, we got some facial expressions, which you'll see with generally any character design model sheets. The look of disgust. This is how I feel quite often. angry and let's see here in a golden book I think it was called Dirty Money this just with Darkwing Duck's outfit is the cover a lot of this art is reused and recycled throughout a lot of Darkwing Duck's other insulary adventures nice breakdown on the body shape and I'm not going to show every single opposing page simply because some of them are just duplicates unfortunately Showing detail on his sweater and on how he operates at home. Sometimes a little goofy, sometimes he's all but the mother of the house. It all varies. Darkwing Duck was not the most hyper-masculine of all the superheroes, let's be honest. And of course, his spirited adopted daughter, Goslin. And what's really interesting about these that I hadn't pointed out yet is when you look at the font, you see... Darkwing up here in Banco font, which is what that's called, and the duck was just kind of thrown together similar to the DuckTales font. I can't remember the exact name of that specific font, but if you look at the finalized they've actually got elsewhere, like on the cover, it's completely different than what they have here on the model sheets. Let's see here. Come on, separate with me, Paige. I wonder if this is all that uh, that gentleman has on Darkwing Duck. Because if you want to talk about a show that could use a lot more resourcing, Darkwing is definitely one of them. A lot of character in any of these. Of course, Goslin being the tomboy, literally listed in her file card on her Playmates toy as her occupation. Showing a breakdown, approximately two and a half heads high, obviously child proportions, big old feet. And of course we have Honker, who, if you look at the Playmates toy line, nah, not the most uh, appealing character in terms of toy. But as far as, you know, the typical nerd, uh, he worked, he did, his, he did his job. A lot of unanswered questions there, but yeah, it's what it is. Oh, dude, Grim, there is a mega bolt in here you got to see when we get to his near end of the book, so it's great. Nobody's really all that excited about Honker, unfortunately. What I really like about some of these things is you'll see a lot of notations here. You see this in Thundercat model sheets as well, too, like hair tufts do not need to be closed off, no color separation. Yeah, because... You know, his hair, quote-unquote his hair, and his body were the same color, so. Now, here's the really interesting one. Launchpad's model sheet doesn't seem to be any different from the ones on DuckTales, but there are some differences in how he's portrayed in DuckTales versus here. Uh, one difference is body language. In Darwin Duck, he's a little more bumbling, but he's a little more out there, and his bottom jaw is actually wider. It's bigger. So, they're essentially using variations on the DuckTales design, but, you know, he, he is a bit different in the Darkwing Duck cartoon, and there's a in-canon reason for that if you want. According to Tad Stone, Darkwing Duck and DuckTales are not in the same continuity. Darkwing Duck happens in a completely different universe than DuckTales. And when people ask, well, or say, well, that's not possible, blah, 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 blah. Well, first of all, uh, Tad Stone, the entirety of Darkwing Duck is an ode to comics, and alternate universes are kind of common there, but he actually made it very pointed. If Darkwing Duck has an anvil fall on him, he gets up with a bump on his head. If Scrooge has an anvil fall on him, he dies. So there's definitely differences. Of course, mouth movements. This is very important when you're trying to nail down how a character is supposed to move when they talk. Ah, this... <laughs> This is the Megavolt initial concept I wanted to show you, Grim. These are great. Ah, these are great. Look at this, look at this. Giant flashlight battery on the back. Idea for Megavolt. 
And it says here on the bottom, face needs definitely work. <laughs> I love it. And, you know, the thing about Tuscanini is obviously there was like some sort of theater buff or music buff in there. You know, Tuscanini, Tuscanini, who just puts that character in. Because he's not very often utilized. He's not the not a fan favorite, to say the least. Then, of course, we have Moliarty. A play on, Mar you know, Moriarty. Sherlock Holmes' is nemesis because Darkwing Duck's a detective. And the book just ends. It just ends. And that's literally it for the Darkwing Duck book. So, with the Daring Duck of Mystery out of the way, I uh, hit one if you want BotCon next, and two if you want SWAT Cats next. Now, it's the smallest of the books. Just like the cartoon. Right, Grim. Right. Oh, man, we're neck and neck so far. Oh, one they're leading out. Ah, now we're Matt's again. Uh, all right, I guess we'll be leaving SWAT cats for last. Go ahead and get this all sorted out. Now, out of all three books, of course, the BotCon book is the most professionally put together because it's, well, done by professionals. Not that I'm saying Mike Swan again isn't a professional, but BotCon... People have been putting books away for a while. I believe Peter Sinclair is the one that got this all informated out. BotCon is, was, a very unique thing. And I do desperately miss what it was. I don't, I don't know if I'll be going to the new one. Because I went to the old one because it was like the place for Transformers. And the new one's going to be a typical convention that's a mismatch of a lot of things. And I can get that anywhere. I don't need to travel out of town to get that. Of course, you got the forward and an introduction talking about the origin of it. Showing you a guide here about how to use it, what different things mean. And talking about some of the exclusives here, which is what we're going to be focusing on. Now, I didn't get hardcore into collecting Transformers until the late 90s, right? During Beast Wars. I wasn't even aware BotCon existed at that time. But BotCon started in 1994 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So this is right around the time G2 ended, right? Really small convention, but somehow they were able to get a uh, convention exclusive out breakdown from the GoBot line. And man, I can't even imagine how much this thing probably costs now. Yeah, I wish they didn't need her, Dimos, but there was a lot going on that I don't even know if I can talk about on here, even though I'm not the one legally bound to it, but it's, um, uh, Fun Pub made a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes, and Hasbro did not take well to it, and there was constant fighting also in dealer's room because of third-party stuff. So, BotCon 95, this one was in Dayton, Ohio. That's the nice thing about BotCon, specifically if, you were, if you're married and you have a spouse that likes to do traveling and sightseeing, BotCon was in different places every year. Just mere 10 years after the whole thing began, yeah. 10 years after the original cartoon. This one, this is an exclusive I actually got at TFCon in uh, Reston, 2019. It was one of my Grail items, the um, Onyx Primal Predacon. I was able to snag them for under 100 bucks. I was happy. Still got them, too. Freaking awesome. And of course, I'm in black. Reference um, in this. This is, uh, I can't remember what the name of that movie is. I'm not very big on live action. You'll have to excuse me. Hello, Jeff McKee. Oh, well, or Elwi, I think that's how it's pronounced. Copy of this book at a college library. I would hope not. This thing just came out a few months ago. But you got some. Uh, some product details about some earlier exclusive ideas. Tables of treasures. Like, I could go through this entire book 
telling you about everything, but you should probably just buy the book. <laughs> kind of right, dude, like, right time travel, yo. Uh, you got Pack Rat and Fractal, which, oddly enough, I was able, I didn't snag these guys, but the last bot con I went to, they were exclusives, uh, modern ones of them, so. We'll get to all that. This is, this is when, or when I started looking back at bot cons back in the early 90s. Or late 90s, rather, because it was like 98, 99 when I started looking into it. Like, tackle free, only McElwee. Okay, no biggie. All right. So this is the stuff that I look back at. I'm like, man, it must be awesome to go to these. I was a teenager. I'm like, I ain't got no money, but I want all this stuff. And at some point, my, my adult brain might kick in and say, hey, stupid, you can afford this stuff now, but we'll see. This is still during the heyday of Beast Wars, a repaint of... Inferno becoming Antagony, a female Predacon, sent by Shakarakt, Vice Grip. Ah, oh, man. Heroic Predacon Sandstorm. It is not Shattered Glass talking about. You missed the Darkwing Duck book, but the SWAT Cat book's after this, so don't worry. Darkwing Duck book was actually very short. Windraiser. I wanted this so bad when I was a kid because he's so cool looking. It's just a, a white and purple slash pink retico of Silverbolt from Beast Wars, but he's so cool. And I do have him now. Um, I actually got him at the first BotCon I attended, but because of how he's packaged, he's in bubble wrap. We're well, not bubble wrap. He's in a blister pack, right? So he's got the card in the blister, just like an arc, that, a regular action figure back in the day. He's not in a box, so I can't just take him in and out. So he just sort of sits in there. <laughs> Looking at Michael Swanigan's IMDb page, and he worked on a ton of shows we've all watched. The 90s Marvel cartoons, Dennis the Menace, 87 Team and Team, Mighty Max, Static Shock, does not surprise me. And Yeah, he was in the PS1 game, wasn't he? Of course, we got some watches over here. We got multimedia posters. Like, they had some, some wild stuff back here, man. And then we get to the thousand year mark, right? We get to 2000. We got Shucker Act finally coming in. And Ape Link. I saw him at a TF Con, and I regret not buying him, but man, I just didn't want to drop like 200 right then and there. But now he's more, he's more than that, so it's going to be hard to find. Disrespect the law, and you disrespect me every regard in Skyrim. Also, me and Lyos Monstering. Thank you very much, Coyote. I appreciate you being here. I don't think we're going to run into any trouble. We're having a pretty calm stream, and the type of people I mess with aren't dumb enough to show up here. I want to get this poster at some point. It's obviously an homage to the Transformers the movie poster, except about the storyline that was going on at the time, which was, whew, at some point I need to do a video about because it was just plain Wyatt, or Wild, rather. On She-Ra, in the one episode they tried to sneak in the model sheet from Dragon's Lair two years before the King Carly, you jerks. How did you get these books? This one I ordered uh, from Big Bad Toy Store. The other two, the Swat Cat and Darkwing Duck book, you can just find on eBay. We have a Transmetal 2 Black Arachnia repainted as, if I'm not mistaken, the very first official RC toy. Good luck getting a hold of her. She's more than a pretty face. And then we have Transmetal Tigatron, who is a repaint of X9 Ravage. I got him also at my first BotCon. Thank God, because I only paid like 150 for him, and now he's going for like 400 Sheesh. And he is really neat, like... For the exclusive that was Ravaged to be turned into this as an exclusive for BotCon, number one, it's wild. Number two, great color choice. It's absolutely beautiful. But they're they're unique enough to where you're never going to see them at retail, obviously. So We got the printing posters and the Maximals and Predacons. Of course, the glare makes it hard to see the Maximals up here. But I actually have the Predacon one. And now we're getting into 2002, where we have Beast Machine start showing up. So we have Jetstorm, his Ultra Class figure, being repainted as Cyclonus. And a Night Slash Cheetor being turned into a character called Cat Scan and a bunch of other random insulary characters. Ah oh man, this stuff was wild. They introduced Cryotech and Primal Prime as characters in the ongoing continuity. It looks like Shattered Glass Ravage. Well, I mean, not really. 
Not really. That was actually the inspiration. For, there was no shattered glass. Oh, you're talking about the shattered glass rabbit. Yeah, that makes sense. Man, you got all these trading cards too. Man, this is so awesome. Or postcards. That's even better. Because they're bigger. 2004 now. Pasadena, California. They went to California a lot, obviously. I do genuinely miss BotCon. Like, I really do. We have examples of the packaging for these figures, too. Like, flat-out ones. So I guess if anybody wanted to somehow get a high-def scan and reproduce them, they could. It's not like you're going to get the figures reproduced. What was really neat about BotCon is it was official, too. Like, you don't often see conventions that are sanctioned by the company of the owner of the IP. Yes, and that's because it was funny. <laughs> okay, so 2005, this was in Frisco, Texas. Now, keep in mind, I was an adult at this point, right? Adult, made my own money, had a good job. My stupid self, because I never focus on myself for some dumb reason, it wasn't until much later my dumb self said, hey, stupid, you're an adult, you can go to BotCon now. I'm like, oh, I can go to BotCon now. But back in this, during this time, a couple years after 2005, I was looking for G1 Desaurus because he was a gray item for a very long time. And somebody on the AllSpark listed that they were selling Deathsaurus for like 60 bucks, no picture. And I'm like, you know what, I'm going to gamble. Even if he's in bad condition, I'll have him. And he sent me this one. <laughs> so I didn't even know that this was made at the time. So I looked it up. I'm like, you know what? I contacted the seller. I'm like, this isn't quite what I thought it was. But I'll take it because he's freaking awesome. And I still have him. And he is, he is really cool. Now we get a little bit wilder and uh, some of the other convention exclusives that eh, kind of hit and miss. Energon was a very strange and bizarre toy line that I think I have like one figure from. How's it going, Alex Lemons? We're actually going over Transformer stuff. Glad you could make it. Ah, 2006. Now this is a year that a lot of people got the exclusive sets and these are some of the highest highest priced exclusive still out there because they are pre-Beast Mode Beast War characters. So you got Optimus Primal, you got Rhinox, Dinobot, Cheetor, Rat Trap, and... <laughs> God, these things go for so much now, like, oh, in their thousands. Did you know LEGO had a V-22 that ended up being banned? I don't know anything about LEGO, my dude. That's a great mold and far worth the 60 Oh, God, it was. I love that mold. Although I notice every time they've done one that's not, like, the original and it's repaint of, you know, uh, R.I.D., Megatron, and Galvatron, they always omit the bat muzzle for some reason. You got Beast Wars Megatron, Buzzsaw, Laserbeak, Waspinator, Tigatron, who has, like, the best colors, Rumble, Inferno, like, Though this box set goes for a lot of money. You can get the Beast Wars prequel comic, yes, and it also came with the uh, Beast Wars box set that got released several years ago. Messenger Bag, man. These things are so doggone cool. I know I keep saying that, but I really wish I had, had been of the mind to do this stuff at the time. But that's just the way my brain always works for some reason. I ignore myself. If you can't tell by how little content I actually get out here versus people's messes I try to fix. But then again, we get in 2007. This was the year right after Classics where they put out the Classics line that brought back, you know, iconic designs for Optimus, Megatron, and all that. So this one right here, the Thundercracker here, had a, had a bit of a bit of a goof off. Same with Thrust here. Because at the time, Thrust, Dirge, and Thundercracker, they weren't at retail. And these are supposed to be exclusives, but they all eventually, these three eventually made it to retail. Slight different deco, I believe. So there was a little bit of fussing over that, but, you know, people got over it. And now, they're freaking exclusives everywhere, and everybody hates it. Man. See, things like this I'm not so interested in getting, in terms of, like, BotCon exclusives. Because they just don't appeal to me. I'm more of a, I've always been a Beast, Beast Wars guy, so... Can't tell you how much I wanted that Dreadwind. Oh, man, he is cool looking. I'll give you that much. And, of course, then we get into some of the Shattered Glass stuff. And I can't stand Shattered Glass, but we'll go over it anyways. 
I, I just find it unoriginal, unappealing. There, there's just nothing about that I find unique. I hated that toy. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just not a fan. I'm not a fan of the Armada toy line. It just it felt like a massive step back to me. Art for these were good, though. Then again, the artists are always good artists that they pull for BotCon. Now we get in 2009, and we're starting to see some more inner John stuff, and, eh, you know, good, good hit or miss. The Thunderclash is pretty neat based on the Rodimus they had. And here's some more that I actually want to pick it up. I actually want to pick it up that Elita because, you know, I mean, we're up here at her. It's Elita. Can't go wrong with a Fembot. And this Razor Claw, because, I mean, come on. Come on. It's Razor Claw. I'm going to get Razor Claw. Well, there's a pretty big difference between an exclusive source like a con or a store exclusive to the 10 people who get to buy one. That's also true. I won't deny that. It's just irritating either way, my dude. Let's see here. Dymo says, to be honest, Shattered Glass would have been better if they didn't do the cliche reversal plot, but have Optimus be a well-intentioned extremist like in the Bay movies and Megatron just isn't bad. True. Is Shattered Glass where all the evil Transformers have goatees? Kind of? Let's see here. Neat little Leo Zack. Wish we'd have a more modern interpretation of some of those victory characters, but you know. They've got Black Zarek. I'm grateful for that much, if nothing else. I was able to pick up this at a previous BotCon, because that's just a really freaking neat lithograph for a 25th anniversary. Nice smattering of different new versus old. Transformers in Disguise Generation 2 Redux. This is where it should have kicked me in the teeth to make me remember that I could that I was an adult, but it didn't. Thank you, Coyote. I appreciate the Father's Day wishes, and happy Father's Day to those in the chat who are also parents. Should have kicked me in the teeth to get this, because I liked G2, but nope, it didn't, because I are dumb, and... God, what was I doing then? Oh, I was doing a bunch of other stuff for other people. Of course I was. Aha! Backlight poster. Everybody needs a backlight poster. Or a blacklight poster, rather. And now we're into the year of animated exclusives. 2011, Pasadena. You got Motormaster, you got basically all the Stunticons, right? Could they combine? No, but they're there. There were some neat concepts in animated. I did, in, I did in general enjoy animated as a cartoon. I just feel it's overhyped. I want that Cinder Sword. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, thank you, Leandro. Giant Transformers figures, man. There are some that I actually want. Uh, here's a Thundercracker, an apparent a, a G2 Thundercracker that apparently a third-party company and Dymos is the one that brought this to my attention made a version of this with that color, but the box art is an homage to Captain Planet. Dude, Allspark, tell me. This feels like a couple years ago, not a decade. More than a decade now. Almost more than a decade, man. And you know, I like TFCon, but it's not the same, man. It's just not the same. It's the G1 Action Master, huh? My knowledge of Transformers is not as complete as my knowledge of Thundercats, so I do apologize. So that's the Action Master color, huh? I wonder why it's set in the year of G2, then. Oh, no, that was the previous year. I'm getting old. All right, so now we're finally at, finally at, the BotCon I first attended. This was in 2012, and it was in Dallas. So I roomed with Zaku2, who was a longtime Allsparker. I don't know what or if he does anything now. Really great guy. This is where I went to meet some of the guys that used to run ramp or run all over the place in the Beast Mayhem forums. And on the way there, my car, it's cat it's not catalytic converter. It's um the gasket head died. Like it that sucker barely got me to the hotel. I had to take a bus home. <laughs> my car died as soon as I got to the hotel. So that was that part wasn't fun, but being there and finally meeting people I had known for over a decade from the AllSpark and other places was very much so worth it. Dealer's room freaking blew my mind. Like, one, the reason why I miss BotCon so much in terms of dealer's room is TFCon, all these other places, don't get the same pull. 
you could go to BotCon, you could find rare Japanese Transformers at a price that may hurt, but not be completely unreasonable. And you could find basically anything you want. You can't really do that with TFCon. I love it. I do. I really do. But you couldn't do that with TFCon. So I'd actually need at some point or want at some point to get this set because I didn't. I didn't have the funds to do so at the time. Um, I walked out of that convention. Was it that? Con actually, now I can't remember if it was this first one or the second one. Actually, no, it was the second one. It was the second bot con that I wound up getting Tigatron and Windraiser. This bot con, I got like a couple of smaller figures and I got the Masterpiece Grimlock. I remember that now because the Masterpiece Grimlock was somebody tried somebody tried to swindle me previously that year on. So I just said, you know, I'm going to go there and I'm going to get him specifically. And I did, and it was cool. And also, it's the first time I ever saw a Diaclone Grimlock. Like, that was that was fascinating. I wonder if the toy store here still has one, because I know they did. Spinster and Octopunch. Of course, this was during the reveal of the shield and all that, which was a decent toy line, believe it or not. Man. So now we're going to be getting into every bot con that I went to. This is going to be fun. But real quick before I go to the next year. One of the people I met is Adam Gardner. Now, Adam Gardner on the AllSpark and everywhere else at one point had been known as Chopperface69. That dude is like the dude who taught people how to troll. I don't know how many times he got banned from by the AllSpark. He always came back, like officially came back. But <laughs> I, I had some fun. I show up at that convention in the horse mask. There's actually, I think, still a post on Reddit with, with me in the horse mask. But I walk into where they're having lunch, and I'm wearing that mask, and they invite me to have a seat. And when I do, I look across the table through the horse mask mouth, and I see Adam, and he's smiling at me. He's got these wide eyes. And then I blink, and he's gone. And I turn my head, and he's next to me, like somehow instant transmission. And he starts making out with the mask's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> in front of everybody to where the energy was obvious this man is getting attention and I'm going to ruin it <laughs> that's just how Adam is I love that guy he's he's married he's got some he's got some kids now like I'm I'm so happy for him that dude is that dude was wild <laughs> when the kids try to troll us on discord I think back to Adam <laughs> think back to Adam and think pathetic god Adam Adam had a mastery of it, but he didn't seem to do it with, like, pure malicious intent. He wouldn't do some of the things people do nowadays. Like, um, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but there was the, uh, there was the men shampoo incident. There was Hooray Golden God. <laughs> the, it was never a, ha I'm going to post your address, and I'm going to send a SWAT team after you. That's, that was never how Adam operated. It was always a, I'm going to make everybody uncomfortable, but they'll survive type of way. He made a poster board diorama of the All Star building on fire, and I was falling out of it. I was on fire. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he also do like a Goatsy Matrix or something like that? God, that man! <sighs> I'm gonna start crying. <laughs> BotCon being replaced by HasCon was like when you were a kid and your fave cartoon was being replaced by something similar yet somehow worse, like Sonic Sad M with Underground True. <laughs> uh, uh, I miss Adam's shenanigans, but they will live on. He has children now, and that should terrify everybody. All right, so Machine Wars was the 2013 one. I still didn't get the box set because things happened, but I did attend, and this is where I got like Tigertron and all that. I remember there was, I can't remember what the issue was, but there was apparently some major issues in terms of assembly for some of these figures, which occasionally happen at BotCon. And, I don't know, there was a lot of complaint about them on the board, but I can't remember what. Something about the storyline, too, and war crimes? I, I can't even remember, man. Yeah, I blocked out a lot, but boy, I miss those. You know, to a point I do, too, but I'm also in a better place now, and I think we all are. God, we used to take some things there really so seriously, and now... Now we look back at it like, man, why did we get so mad about those things? Like, so unreasonably mad. And then I see things that actually elicit the proper type of anger. I'm like, okay, this is worth getting mad about. Oh, man, Autobot Electrons. Okay, so I got a, I got a terrible story to tell you about this specific toy, right? So, never been big into arguing politics. But I was added by a friend once years ago to something called the Thunderdome, which is where people argued on politics, they'd get on Zoom chats three times a week, and that's where I'd utilize the bird. 
He'd get in there and he'd just piss everybody off. Wasn't even arguing politics. And one of the guys there messaged me. And he's like, I looked at your profile. You're really big on Transformers. I had one when I was a kid. Like, he was, he was like made of gold plastic and he blew up. It was like a modern one. And I pointed into this. And then I found his name in the news a few years later. Apparently that dude was like a hardcore, like unironic white supremacist slash white nationalist. I'm like, ugh, dodged the bullet on that one. I mean, you know, ugh. But man, yeah. I remember um, at this convention, uh, Rob Roberts, Cheetamus, good friend of mine, he uh, he was doing a lot of custom paint for people on this specific toy. They would drop it off because he's, I think it was from the, was this from the uh, unpainted custom set? Yeah. This is from the Unpainted Custom Figure Set. You can either buy the figure itself or you can attend the custom class, which I never could because that thing always sold freaking out. But Cheetamus would paint these things custom for people. He'd have his own little booth. He was really neat. That's that's a really good guy. I miss I miss him. He's not gone. <laughs> He's still around, but he hasn't been at conventions in a while, okay? Don't want to miss sell people on that. And, of course, the Machine Wars Termination Lithograph. Alright, so now we're getting into the actual sets I bought. So 2014, Pasadena, California. This is actually the first bot con I took my now wife to with me. It was the Pirates and Knights, and you had Fire Guts Jinrai, who I'm sure Dymos will recognize. The very first figure of DevCon, and of course you had Pirate Cannonball. Arr, no prey, no pay. You got Return of Fan Favorites, like Shuckerect. You had some more unique characters like Flame War and uh, Ferric. Of course, I have all of these. I actually would kind of hog on all of them. You have Knight Alpha Trizer, who's apparently a hyper-evolved form of Cheetor. You finally came back to Ape Link, and you have Flare Up. Now, there was some um, little bit of kerfuffle. People didn't like some of the way the art was handled in the comic for this year. I found the art kind of cute, see? Um, I get why some people were offended. They thought it was a little hypersexualized, but uh, I, I personally watched me get canceled for this. I personally thought it was a big deal over nothing. And of course, some of the exclusive stuff for like the souvenir set of what's the word? Custom paint jobs is a uh, fire gut sort of primal prime here, which is just an apling Renico, which is really neat because at the time. Like, these were just throwbacks. I'm like, ah, oh, finally. I'm getting variations of characters I always wanted. And we have Pounce and Wingspan here as the two Viacons. One from Prime, from Prime, you know, one turns to car, one turns to the jet. These were actually inspired by customs Cheetamus had done. And at the time, you know, they gave them credit for it. They don't in this book for whatever reason. Probably because they don't give credit to anybody in the book, really. But that's why whenever I give grief to Mattel about what they did with Duplicat, it's like... BotCon did it, but you won't. It's kind of stupid. Both were convention exclusives, so let's not play this game. So, let's see here. Of course, you have the lithograph. You have all this stuff. 2015. We're nearing the end, boys. This is Most Wanted, which had different reticos and different characters, like always. Battle Trap, you know, from the Generation Springer. You had Breakdown, it turned into a version of Megatron. And of course, you had a Oil Master as a double pretender. Because Monkey. And here you have Pack Rack. Back up for the first time in a long time. General Optimus Prime. I don't, I don't, I didn't get every figure this year. It just didn't appeal to me. But what did appeal to me was the. I didn't get the custom class, obviously. You know what? I never did. But I got the figure, and it was Galvalio Convoy, which is a uh, very difficult figure to get for the original Beast Wars: The Second Line because it was a lucky draw, and like five people have one. <laughs> And my wife actually has a hat from this. And we're about to get to the final year of BotCon. 
BotCon 2016 in Louisville, Kentucky. I got the box set here too, and it was also very appropriate because it's the Trapedicus Council. It was during the middle of Combiner Wars. Also Tarantulas and Ravage. Combining to form Trapedicus. There were insulary characters. Of course, you had Pterosaur here and Tigatron and Unit 3, which is a reference to a McDonald's toy. And one thing everybody had been wanting. For years, there was a conceptualization of the R.I.D. Megatron as Beast Wars Megatron, and they never decided to put it into play until the final year of BotCon. Now, I have my complaints, only just due to I think the bright red on the color palette just kind of doesn't mix well with the gold because of the tint of the gold. But this is a highly sought after exclusive now. I'm glad I got one, not because it's highly sought after, because I just love this mold. Again, I bought it four times at this point. So it's... I remember there was a lot of anger. Because on the last day, some dude... Because on the first few days, like, convention prepayers uh, got to come in and buy one, and then they can come back later and buy more if they want. One dude, like, came and just bought the rest of them out. So, scalpers exist at conventions, of course. And, of course, at the time, you could grab some of the other figures and turn them into the maximal uh, magna boss quote unquote and, yeah, it wasn't really convincing that was the last year of botcon botcon was a lot of fun and i i sorely miss it so when they said that it was coming back and yeah i got the rubber ducks too <laughs> signed by david cape when they said it was coming back man i was so excited but then you know, you guys saw the interview I did with Peter, and while I don't hold any grudge to him as a person, like, it just doesn't seem like the type of convention that I'd really been looking for. I mean, I can, I can find general mecha or fan conventions in my own state. I, I don't need to travel for it. Transformer conventions, on the other hand, that's that's a highly specified thing, and it has a very specific feel to it. The BotCom name has a lot of legacy behind it, and the fact that it's dead, um, truly dead, is saddening. I only got to experience a few years of it myself. Um, a friend of mine who I'd roomed with several times, Headmaster Don, like that dude, he went to all but one. He missed one BotCon. That, that is awesome. Like, that's legacy. Real nerd legacy, but legacy nonetheless. Hello, Avatar Machiro. I hope when we get Kingdom Tarantulas, he'll be repainted in his primeval Don Foss Kid self. Well, if he does, they don't, somebody else will. A lot of memories there. Diatlas concept. Some of these are the, the ones that never made it. Now that would just be a killer idea. Botcon, its name is owned by Shining Light, or Shining, uh, what is it? Night Shinings LLC, which is one of the things Peter Sinclair is with right now, so it's not something that Hasbro currently owns, and I don't think they're interested in owning it. Actually, no, Avatar, we have not gone to that. That's the last one, so I hope you enjoyed taking a look at the book. Thankfully not in high enough quality, I'll get sued for showing everybody. I haven't in a long time, Alex Lemons. All right, so this is the one you guys have been patiently waiting for, and People keep asking, have you gone through this one yet? Have you gone through this one yet? So, we're going to go through this one. Alright, so, like the Darkwing Duck one, not official. No written by, no nothing. It shows the um, copyright stuff, but if you'll notice, it's partly cut off. This is not sanctioned. Just a really good compilation. A lot of show-related stuff, show notes and whatnot here. Let's see here. I actually didn't vote for the Windblade thing. I'm usually behind the times when it comes to Transformers fan-related things, oddly enough. Talking about log lines, talking about episode, production codes, and all that. This is, this is actually a much more uh, complete book than the Darkwing Duck one we just looked at. 
Man, we almost been here almost an hour already? That's wild. Yeah, the revival... We haven't heard word from that at all for like a year now. Now, you want to talk about another thing I really wish I had paid attention to is that Kickstarter. I wasn't aware of it until after it ended. I would have loved to have gotten hold of that book. The Radical Squadron. Yep, and we're looking at different model sheets now, which is what most of this book is, like the other Darkwing Duck one. Now, here's what got people really interested, because, of course, there's that Art of Swat Cat book that's official, done by the Tremblay Brothers, that was a Kickstarter exclusive, a prize. Which, again, if you try to find one, then good luck paying $500 for it. But, man, look at this. Look at that draftsmanship. These are skilled freaking artists, man. Wild. The show deserved better than it got. Well, that's what happens when you have people being outraged grifters concerning children's cartoons and violence, of all things. Like, line of action's absolutely fantastic. Great posing. It's just perfect draftsmanship. Kickstarter ended in 2015, Avatar Machiru. What's really interesting about this book, though, is it doesn't have the pre-production designs, which is what I found fascinating. Because if you actually look at the pre-production designs of the SWAT cats, they're so much more unique than the new ones. But the pre-production ones were what was used for the evil SWAT cat designs in that one episode where they went into an alternate universe. Blocking out of the character individual poses and of course up here you have character sheets for how it looks for the bandana mask underneath the helmet notating not to use pupils unless it's called for in scene check your board you know check your storyboard there was an unmade episode with a succubus yes well the writers that were interested in doing a new SWAT cats show were the same ones who worked on season two so I wouldn't be too concerned about that Facial expressions, getting into Razor now. Show his body breakdown and all that. Now, the alternate universe didn't have dogs. Just every character that was good was bad sometimes, except Lieutenant Farrell wasn't bad. Felina Farrell wasn't bad. Dark Cat was still bad. Like, I remember when somebody did a review of it, it's like, this is, like, <sighs> Darkwing Duck's life, the Negaverse, and everything, and Star Trek's Mirror Mirror was better. Why did they do this? Well, you know, the thing is, it seems like they pitched a comedy show at the very first of the pre-production, but in the middle of it, they went really hard edge. And, like, you'll see some of that for some of the toy designs and whatnot. It's really weird. Like, SWAT Cats has a lot of enigmas to it that I would really wish I could pick their brain to get an answer from. What got people's attention about this book, though, we'll get into very shortly, because we're almost to that point. Again, look at look at this. It's kind of hard to see, because this is, again, a garbage camera. But a lot of detail on everything. And we've got a little bit of a, a response I'm going to give here to a few things. Nope. I think the SWAT Cats website, the official one, has um, all of these. This entire book, I think, is actually scanned on there if you want to take a look at it. But, man, again, look at this. Like, no, seriously, look at that. That is absurdly detailed. And this is a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. Like, what the heck, man? Like, these were skilled draftsmen with a real passion for this stuff. They did not. They only made, for the toy line, there were only four figures made. T-Bone, Razor, Dark Cat, and Dr. Viper, and none of them looked like their show counterparts. They were, I don't know what happened there. Whew. They command a lot now, but good lord, they were bizarre. Alright, here's what got everybody's attention about these, about this book. 
Felina Farrell's model sheets were extremely hard to get a hold of. Like, extremely hard to get a hold of. But this book has them. So you got the turnaround, you got detail shots of the weapon, you got her with different facial expressions. Thank you for the $5 Super Chat Dymo C, semi-related, but I wish Hannah Barbera did a Space Ghost TV movie with the same style of Johnny Quest TV movies with theatrical animation. Man, we wish. I'm not a furry, but Felina, I will make an exception to you. You know, I hear a lot of that, I'm not a furry, but things. But you know, she's a strong woman, I can get that. I understand that. So I made a line of enforcer toys. Well, they're probably a lot easier to make. See here. I think Commander Farrell's voice actor also narrated the opening credits for Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad. He was also the voice for Space Ghost and quite a few things, too. I need Chopper backup. Those meddling SWAT cats. Of course, some action shots of her. Shadows fall on it. Nerefana Felina, as her design looks too human. You know, there's an interesting dichotomy here when it comes to male character designs and female character designs in this show. Like, the females look far more human, the males look far more feline. Of course, some, some beautiful draftsmanship again on Felina and her cockpit. And now we're on to Callie, and this is one reason why I'm really happy I have this book, because now I don't, if I ever have to draw this character, I won't have to look for her on Google, because there are horrifying things there, and I don't want to see that. Detail on how to draw her eyes within the frames of the glasses, the turbo, or the SWAT cat communicator, miscellaneous poses. Kelly is my second. Dog got it, Dimos. Then we have Mayor Mangs, voiced by Jim Cummings. Let's see. Swat cats, how do you do it? Let's see here. They're not in season one. Look at Kelly, for example. Let's see here. Come on, Paige. Separate for me. Some of these are just duplicates with shadow added to them. Some rough drawings of him in earlier concept with his toupee more um, out. See it able to fly off and he keeps it on a little head. And now we get to Commander Farrell. Five dollar thank you for a super chat. Small slurpees are a dollar a piece. Please enjoy five on me. Well thank you very much. You know I, what I liked about Commander Farrell is like every hero for the most part's got to have like that that hard as nails guy that just does not like them that isn't evil. Spider Man is J. Jonah Jameson. Batman has Harvey Bullock. SWAT cats have Commander Farrell. And while he was a pig headed idiot in some cases, and while he um, was very arrogant early on, you find out later he's very much so a man of principle, regardless of how he may feel about the SWAT cats as people. He does understand that they do tend to do some good. He just wishes they'd be more by the book. And Goral is hot. Doggone it. Well, we got model sheets of her, too, so calm down. Like, a very standout moment for Commander Farrell was when he was given the possibility of knowing who the SWAT cats were by uh, Mac and Molly Mange, and he just responded he doesn't make deals with criminal scum, and he wiped them out. Very much so a principled man. Man cat. As angry and sometimes dumb as his decisions were. He also wasn't a coward, which is very much so a, uh, a nice thing. The thing about Commander Farrell, and yeah, I agree, I like his design too, Grim. I don't know what type of cat he's supposed to be. Like, obviously, you know, Mayor Manx, he's a Manx. Callie, even though she's not colored like one, supposed to be a Calico. Burke. Mark Hamill did the voice of Burke. I don't know what other characters he did the voice of, but you can tell this is Mark Hamill. <laughs> sort of a drawn-out, dopey joker. Burke and Murray, who were the characters who officially ran the uh, dump. 
You see, the most thing is, what do you mean by panther, right? Panther isn't actually a cat. A panther is a specific notation uh, that we give to a different type of cat. A leopard can be a panther, so it can a mountain lion. What we call a black panther is either a melanistic leopard or a melanistic jaguar. Jaguar and leopards are two completely different cat. Brock Peters was dark cat. Yes, he was also Boo Radley in To Kill a Mockingbird, the live-action movie. Thank you for the $5 Super Chat, Adam HR. It says, as I'm looking at this, it just reminds me I need to rewatch that show again. So thank you, Lyle. Well, it's on DVD, so feel free to snatch it up. Official DVD, too. Although I think there's some, some issues with it. I think some of the uh, title cards are missing or something. Warner Brothers has never been very good about cataloging their stuff. I know Mark voiced another character using his normal voice. I think the voice character he did was Angora's uh, cameraman. Speaking of which, here's Angora. I hope you're happy now, Jeff. Angora, cat's eye news. Yeah, this guy. Pretty sure it's this guy. Oh, he did Darth Vader, too. Interesting. Now we have the chopper pilot. And now we get into the vehicles, like the Turbo Cat and the cat's eye news chopper. At least for size comparison, because we were just talking about the news cats. Fun fact. Because for the longest time, Warner Brothers owned SWAT cats, and they still do own the rest of the original cartoon in so much as distribution and whatnot. If you look at the first few seasons of Aqua Teen Hunger Force, a lot of the city backgrounds and every time there's a helicopter, it's, it's an enforcer chopper. And the background is Mega Cat City. <laughs> then we got the sergeant enforcer who he sounded like it was I know it wasn't Robert Stack but he sure sounded like him Galtar Brock voice him. Galtar in a golden lance yeah I've seen it gun omitted for clarity yeah ah, the enforcer commandos nice we need the Turbo Cat to be a G1 Seeker. Nah, because the Turbo Cat was an F-14 and the Seekers were F-15s. Correct, SWAT Cats had a body count. That's actually what got it into a lot of trouble. Pilots are all alike unless otherwise noted. Uh-oh. Maybe they're all from the same litter. <laughs> Alright, so more details about the uh, Turbo Cats. Weak wings are swept back for high-speed flight. Check your board with landing gear. Landing gear doors up here only when needed. I like I like seeing like internal stuff like that. And now is where you see more of the body proportions for the Turbo Cat. And when you actually compare it to a real F-14, this is much beefier. Like it's much wider uh, in in its width, generally than a real F-14. Which would mean if I wanted to make a custom of this from an F-14 model kit, I'd do a lot of modification. I do at some point, by the way, but. For this to have been made for the original toy line, it would have had to be massive. Because T-Bone and Razor were 5-inch figures in and of themselves, and they were beefy, and they wouldn't have fit in the cockpit anyways, because they had really weird V-cut uh, hips. And that toy line was weird, man. Only four action figures, but it's baffling. VTOL engines. Like, this was a really well-designed and really neat concept. Yeah, I got removed from Boomerang. I can't remember when. Probably right around 2015. Justifiably pissed. Correct. What would be the reaction if SWAT Cats got a TV MA reboot? I wouldn't be happy. And now I know that in a city of humanoid cats, there's a house with living food stuffs. Well, yeah. Maybe Dr. Viper and Dr. Weird were college for me. Don't start. I learned it from you, Daddy! Behold, my creation! What is it? Something weird! Ah. You would think they would make a Turbo Cat toy, but never did. I would have definitely bought one for sure. Well, you know, you say that, but SWAT Cat toys, I only ever found, like, twice as a kid in Target 
we're not Target, um, Kmart. It was a Remco toy line figure, and there were no commercials for it. I never saw a SWAT I didn't even know there were toys until a kid from the church told me, and this was kind of like, you know, the he was a kid liar. We didn't believe him. We genuinely didn't. So when we went to Kmart, like a few days later, we're like, well, we're going to prove him wrong. And up, they were there on the shelves. Ugly as sin, but they were there. I think it's funny people blame Captain Planet on ending SWAT cast, but two shows were ended production around the same time. Um, that's because of a miscommunication in how that goes about. Captain Planet didn't end SWAT cats. It took over its time slot. I'm so old, I watched SWAT cats, but it's literally brand new. Same here, man. Same here. being made by morons that go on they'll see highly detailed mech pictures and like well this is something only the Japanese can do they have a specific gift for it because you know that's just how things work I guess magic these type of shots are no different they're just as heavy in detail like all these little buttons and switches are no different than a heavily detailed mech drawing especially when you get into a little more of the nitty gritty here or you add more shading to it or more mood lighting and there's gonna be more of that later but I, I wanted to go ahead and address that real quick because it's something I keep hearing from pundits all over the place way you draw vehicles always draw square really hard to draw not it depends on what you're trying to do there's the uh, emergency shoot starting to see details of the different missiles and where they're kept Yeah, by the time SWAT Cats was in reruns on Boomerang, who the toys were long gone, material. The toys were only on shelves, I think, in 95, 94, 95. 26 years ago. <laughs> I like how much the designers considered each facet of the plane's function and form. Yeah, these old school animators and old school draftsmen, that's how they do it. Uh, if you look at the anim or the model sheets for the Cat Slayer from Thundercats, they have every single room detailed. They built it like a literal building blueprint. You could build a real-life Cat Slayer based on those if you had the funds and the material. Of course, you got the X-Ray Beamer. The cyclotron missile. Who just messes me on the book face? Cyclotron was interesting. Like a lot of this stuff was very toyetic, but they never actually made toys from. It's all right. I'm sure Super Seven will get the license and we get the toys in 2030. You know, Avatar, I want you to go ahead and Google SWAT cat toys, take a look at them, and tell me if they're even something you'd want to look at. Or make the best Thundercat plays at true. Wish we would have gotten a crossover with Batman TS. I'd... Those characters would not play well <laughs> together. They wouldn't. Uh, the SWAT cats have no problem making a body count. Batman does. Uh, high detail on the ejector suits that seats. That's really neat. You know, details of how the missiles launch and everything. That's really cool. Of course, we saw these in the first episode as well. Detail on the oxygen masks. They only wear these O2 masks occasionally. Check your board. Ah, the Glovatrix. The initial concept for the Glovatrix was so much different. It was this massive, like, gauntlet with spikes on it. It's wild. You'd be surprised how many of these model sheets of old classic cartoons are just as detailed as what you would think anime would be. Jake and Chance's tow truck. Funny thing is, the SWAT cat characters, you know, Jake Furlong and Chance, 
Um, they were initially going to be named after the guy who broke the sound barrier. Like, first and last name would be the main character names. Like the guidebooks I have on the anime Don Kuga and JR and GR Giant Robo have the same levels of detail for their model sheets. There's a fan art of SWAT Cat's fighter jet transforming into a robot similar to Robotech. When it came to the miss. Okay. Well, I have quite a few actual other art books for like Gao Gaigar and whatnot too. They're really neat. Side comparison for Cali's sedan. What I liked about SWAT Cats in terms of their vehicle designs for basic cars, it very much so had the sort of Batman animated Art Deco, very obviously 50s inspired cars, pseudo futuristic. Surprise hasn't been a comic. The rights were tied up for a while, for one thing, but there's there's a lot of questions there. And of course, we have some interior detail shots of Cali's sedan. And this is what I'm talking about when you have the same level of high detail and shading and all that. Uh, the animation company Mook, I believe, is what primarily animated SWAT Cats. Season 2, I think, more than anything. If, I could be mistaken on that. That one, I'm sure if I am, Grimm will correct me. Yeah, really neat stuff here. Commander Farrell's sedan. Even shows the undercarriage. Man, that is a clean underbottom. I would never want to work on this car. I don't like working on cars to begin with. Internal details of Commander Feral sedan, including up here. Plush, lit, rich Corinthian leather. We're almost done here, so. I haven't seen enough of Gargoyles to give you too much of a thought, other than the fact that I know the Goliath Chronicles were hot garbage, and the rest of the show tends to be pretty well done. I know they had a lot of budgeting and time issues later on, because Disney, of course, had to try to milk something good and make it as machine line as possible, and Disney sucks, so. Oh, we have something popular for what it is? Let's change it. <laughs> Idiots. Well, yes, because from what I recall, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island was initially pitched as a SWAT Cats movie. Chopper that's always called in for backup. More of those really sweet, sweet internal shots. Hold on. Enforcer jet when landing gear down. Reminds me of the first three seasons of Captain Planet were done by studio. Did the 2001 Cyborg 009 anime and how TMS did overall WB shows back in the day. Yes, they did. Cockpit detail on the Enforcer jet. Or you got cockpit detail more. Getting ready to do a cargo podcast. Neat. Zombie Island deserves better than a mediocre follow up. Well, maybe. <laughs> Some things are just really good as a standalone. Man Manx's limo. Where he always had the uh, Siamese investors. <laughs> Commander Farrell's sedan was massive, by the way. Pull up, you get all the ladies. Come on. Turn with your face. There we go. Thoughts on Invincible? Not my type of story, but the animation could certainly use some um, TLC to it. Every time someone says Captain Planet, my head immediately sings the theme song. Please save me. Nope, can't save you from that one.
Burke and Murray's truck, where they would just be pricks and just unload stuff. Hey, sort this out. Because you owe us. And like the Darkwing Duck book, this one ends suddenly as well. All right, well, I hope you guys have enjoyed looking through these books for an hour and 17 minutes. If you guys got any other questions or comments or anything, let me know, and we can engage on that, and then I'll uh, finish up what I need to for tonight and go to bed now that I'm not feeling absolute garbage. So what do you guys think of these books? Let me know. Why is this set to top chat instead of live chat? I'm missing people's questions, I'm sure. So I'm sorry if I didn't see what you wrote. Thing reverted to top chat instead of live chat for some reason. I just looked at the toys lie on your right. They be ugly. Yeah, they are horrible. Like for some reason, Razor is purple and green <laughs> instead of blue and red. Favorite character from each of the shows. Alright, for SWAT Cats, my favorite character is Razor, and for Darkwing Duck, it's obviously Darkwing Duck. Not to be mean, but when are the normal reviews coming back? Well, it depends on which ones you're referring to. I've got a lot of stuff in the pipeline right now. I need to finish up stuff for Iconicon, I've got to do something for a friend, and I've got uh, the Patreon exclusive video coming in a couple days. Gen Lock review? Probably never, because I've never seen it. Greg Wiseman made a comic because A, he loves the franchise and wanted to continue the story, and B, Goliath's Chronicles fudged up his plans and he was aiming to defudge it. Fair enough. Swat Cat's book in particular was inspiring to look at. A lot of art goal pages there. Trust me, I know the feeling. Well, there's currently one up. Um, again, it's not by it now, so you just got to wait for the auction to end, but nobody else is really going to be interested in it. And there's also an online copy done by, uh, I think, the Tremblay webpage that catalogs all of this digitally. So if you don't want to pay for it, you don't have to, I don't think. I did because I just like having physical copies of things because I'm, I'm old school like that. I also got a while ago um, the Ninja Turtles Rad Plastic book that goes through the entire background of the toy line and the concept art and all that. That's really cool, too. I don't know if that's ever getting a second print either. Really wish Gargoyles had a book like this. Well, let me see here. Let me check eBay. Who knows? Maybe the guy has a book on Gargoyles. Nope. There's a Pop-Up Pals book, though. That's kind of cool. So what are you doing for Iconicon? I am doing a, a, live, a few live streams, one of which is with the, uh, a friend about the history of Leonard Starr's involvement throughout the 80s. A Leonard Starr, you would know as... The guy who did a lot of the hard work to make Thundercats what it was, but he also did work in things like Orphan Annie and On Stage, uh, popular comics at the time. I'll be doing a live stream about child safety then versus now. I've got a video I'm preparing about the history of Thundercats and another one, this name is just completely eludes me at the moment. Ah, yes. 80s anime and manga you must watch or buy, or read, rather. Are you going to review Invincible? No, but I'm going to be putting a little short video up on a friend's channel to try to get him some views about the flaws in the animation. How about War for Cybertron Kingdom, then? I have to do Earthrise first. I have to suffer through that and then review that. There was a SWAT cast animation cell, and I lost it due to being outbid on eBay. Man, them SWAT cast animation cells go for a lot of money. Leonard Starr, the creator of Thundercats, yes. Read Comics Online is really great also if you're a content creator and you just want to be able to pull a scan to use for, like, a video or something.
All right, we have any other questions or comments before we end out the stream for tonight? You should review Gargoyles. I'd have to watch it first. Not that I'm sure the wife would mind, but I also don't think it ever got completely released on DVD because most of these Disney Afternoon cartoons haven't. I think the only ones that have are Tailspin and DuckTales. And the last season, since by DuckTales, was a Disney members exclusive or Disney Club exclusive. So that's going to be fun to track down. Would you ever review SWAT Cats? Absolutely. What I'd like to do with SWAT Cats is I'd like to kind of do what Retro Blasting does and review the cartoon and then the toy line, but I need to get the rest of the toys and the current ones I have. I have an on-card Dr. Viper. Don't want to open him up. And the Razor and T-Bone I have were like modified heavily because I was a kid when I got them, so I'd like to get new ones and just work from there, complete ones. Are you going to react to Bobby Vala's comments on Subpar 7? Well, he's done more than enough, and he knows I support him. Getting art books, got to get the Avatar ones for myself. And thankfully, the Avatar ones are official, so they'll have high-quality stuff in there. 